we're here with Luke Bernard. Is that the right pronunciation? Because English would say Luke Bernard, but Luke Bernard. Luc Bernard, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> Pretty Gotta close, the, yeah. The French, French pronunciation, but owner of Happy Honey, cattle farmer and beekeeper, jiu-jitsu practitioner, or MMA. Practitioner, would, yeah. Or practitioner. I, I was trying to right figure way. out the exact way to say that. And then graduate of agribusiness at the U of M. So what got you into bees and beekeeping? Well, it was actually like it was a friend of mine who was like, oh, I'm getting bees this year. So then he you know, gave me a quick tour of the things. And I always thought it was kind of interesting, but I never really considered it. And then you're thinking about, oh, you know, I'd like to have more, you know, livestock or okay, I'd like to keep farming in some way. But, you know, being, you know, have, buying more land, that could be very expensive. So I'm like, well, you don't really need any more for bees. So I could just place them there. And I was like, well, let's give this a shot. And then like, bam, bam, like within that year, I started getting into it and it's, Pretty interesting and haven't turned back since do we have a good environment here for beekeeping well yeah like we have winter you know most of the year when you think about it so yeah. in a way no but in a way yes like when it's when it's growing season there's like you know they're they're busy yeah you can get quite a lot of honey so yeah it's a good environment out here okay. like man you know beekeepers in manitoba do fairly well because you know it's there's a good environment there's lots of flowers for it when the growing season's here and you know the winter is cold enough to kind of keep a bunch of the bugs away or a lot of some pests away but not too cold that they can't survive out here okay so it's eh, it's a place like any other right i think you can have you have people who keep bees all the way up in the yukon if you really that's crazy that. <laughs> so like two months of summer great and then i know. just imagine somewhere like here compared to say somewhere like california where you have uh where it's nearly summer year round mm -hmm. it'd be much easier to be keep there than it would be somewhere like here right absolutely yeah yeah like there i, I know a lot of beekeepers in the u.s like they'll you know, they go to the one crop and then they just kind of load everything up on a semi and they just move to like another bunch of states where summer is still <laughs> happening. And then they just okay. move that they migrate, they oh. migrate all year. Yeah. Just chasing what they need to do. So what, what they need to chase. So that's kind of interesting that way. Yeah. Well, so what's the process like in terms of you have you raise bees and then you make that into honey. Mm -hmm. What's that? What's that process entail? Because I know nothing about the. You talked about floral variations and things, and like I, I get that that has a, um, a direct correlation to what the end product is like. But I guess I think bees pollen, and then all of a sudden, somehow honey appears in the honeycombs and things, and you <laughs> gotta then then Magic. you gotta harvest that, and then all of a sudden it's at the that at the supermarket and can buy it. Well, but that's that's what I know about it. <laughs> well, the process, yeah, it, you just you know the year starts, you know, it starts in spring. You get them already. And they kind of, they're building up their nest, they're, they're laying little eggs, they're making new ones, and they're trying to expand the colony. And then, you know, right when the flowers all come, there's nectar in the plants. They go, they suck that up, and then they bring it back to the hive. They barf it back up into the little <laughs> things. <laughs> they barf it into the, into the comb. Then they, like, they take away the right, they, they mix it in the proper ratios with, you know, with more of it. And then they fill it up, they make it cure it by like fanning it out, making it a proper humidity level, all that work. Then they cap it with wax and then they do that in like times a gajillion. That's right? crazy. Like so they'll, you... they'll move their own body weight in honey in a day. Wow. Really? So the bee, that's a lot. That's quite a bit, you know, so. So you're saying when I eat honey, yeah. I'm eating bee barf? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it's Pretty mixed much. with like what's in their stomach. There's like there's some amino acids and various other things. And then there's like the protein from the actual plants and stuff in the nectar. So that's kind of what makes that separates honey from just like sugar water or whatever. Because oh, okay. essentially it's just a sugar honey, but there's you know, there's some other things that kind of make it different and hence that the floral variation from, you know, plant you know, from dandelions to like something else, there's a difference just by what by the nectar of the plant. Hmm. So that's that's super cool. Just in terms of I think something that's come along lately is using honey as a natural sweetener in basically anything you're cooking or doing or making which is like a, a cool process like to have that involved with, I guess, in terms of now eating a paleo-oriented diet, the fact that you can use it in so many different recipes to like take the place of either sugars or, or what have you. It's like, it's nice that it's come along and sort of become more mainstream to just use honey in cooking and things too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I guess... It must be nice for you that that's, that's the case and people are becoming more interested. Yeah, people are definitely a lot more interested in honey and how it's produced in the bees and all that, you know, especially with the 
the whole like movement with the you know pollinator health movement you know save the bees and all that stuff but people are interested and they always ask questions and i always feel that's great and i don't know i've substituted sugar pretty much for the most part out of my diet and i just use honey just because i have a lot, huge abundance for it but i really like it you know and as far as using it for other things like you know recipes it's pretty much equally substitutable you know it depends how you cook it but you know it'll taste essentially the same or even a bit better depending on what kind of dessert you're making or whatever right but it's it's nice and i've even heard some people like you know you get a cut and if you can get raw honey which you know it's straight you know hasn't been pasteurized or anything apparently it's got good antimicrobial back uh, property properties in it that can help heal up a little bit so, oh really yeah i didn't know that that's what a lot of people claim and have told me and that's what some people use you know they might have a cut you might you know your rash or some sort of thing like that yeah okay well and then so what's the difference between so a natural product such as yourself like i'm, I'm yeah. gonna expect that yours is organic and straight from the farm and then the store-bought stuff i mean there's even a difference in look like i've tried your product and even tried so i've used it in like on toast and different things but i actually made the energy bites as well okay yeah so yeah, yeah. really enjoyed that like i mean just having that natural sweetener and i didn't have to feel guilty about those energy bites but you could see that the look is different i mean it's thicker and it you can tell the that texture. it's the texture is very different when you think honey that you buy from the store or like bee made or whatever mm -hmm. that it's it's like that squeeze bottle and it's almost clear and just Mm -hmm. You can tell that it's been processed. So maybe the differences between the two. The only difference is that there really is, like, you know, essentially what you're getting at the store is that, you know, there isn't enough people in this world to each have, everybody's got their own hive. So, you know, there's how many million people that want honey, don't have it, and then there's people who, like, have bees, and it's obviously easier to scale up for many people, so they just make a whack load of it. Mm -hmm. So those people sell it to Be Made, which is a co-op, and then they pack it, and it gets processed, and... The only real difference, I'd say, between my stuff, I try to bottle it right after extracting so then I can keep it raw. I find it tastes better, and a lot of people um, agree as well. Um, I feel that the texture comes off better, but when they have to move it, just at ease of, ease of handling, you know, they got to pass, so they have to heat it up to a certain point so that it goes liquidy and it, it flows well, because it's right. pretty hard stuff to work with, especially as it starts to... Um, to crystallize, which is a natural process that just happens over time. So, you know, you reliquify, you heat it, and in, in, in part, you, you pasteurize it, which kills some of the, you know, beneficial or even non-beneficial bacteria or whatever. And some people do it just to, you know, be real cautious as, uh, with stuff like uh, the E. coli, but uh, other bacteria, not good. Uh, botulism, there you Bot go. Yeah, so yeah. that's yeah. why they, I've, I've heard the, and I don't know how true this is, that it's actually... Babies should stay away from honey. They say they under haven't... a year old because their stomachs haven't quite developed yeah. the proper gut flora or something to be able to like fight that stuff off. And I'd be like, I'd err to the side of caution and because that's what everybody's told me. But I think as soon as you're past that, you're good to go. I'd say it's yeah. even better, yeah. For sure. Um, I think the taste is much better. Like I have some at home and, you know, I've had to reheat it up because, you know, I had a pail that I hadn't quite bottled and it's, you know, rock hard and it's... <laughs> Depending on the time. And so I got to really like find that I rebottle it. And I find the taste is, I find the taste is a little bit duller. It's not as sharp or like specific, like in terms of store bought compared to. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's essentially the actual. same stuff. It's there's, you know, you it's not going to, I trust anything that comes from around here is not like that. It hasn't been cut with anything bad. Like you'll, right. you hear some scandals of stuff like that from other countries. It's an easy target, right? Because essentially it's just like a sugar. So some people will cut it with like sugar water or some other non-honey additives. And um, <clears throat> that kind of uh, puts a damper on a lot of, you know, on the industry as a whole and people mistrust stuff. And, you know, you'll have a pile of, you know, you'll get a pile of it that gets treated like that in China and then they move it to like Malaysia. They stamp a new label on it and it gets transshipped. And then, hmm. so that's, that's how some people are a little bit worried and they've heard some stuff and that's kind of, oh, store-bought stuff. But for the most part, I guess that's the only difference is, you know, you're really sure what you're getting with me. To the store, I'd be like 99.9% sure that it's pretty good. It's just, yeah, if mine's raw, it's got a different taste, I'd say, than the stuff that's been, say, heated up to kind of. So then coming from a background, I mean. In farming, yeah. In yeah. farming and cattle farming. Yeah. So how does that translate to what you're doing and sort of like, what, what is that process like in comparison and, and how, how did you see that evolution? Uh, I guess there's some good parallels, you know, you're, I guess with the, at least for the beekeeping, it's like similar, you know, you're raising livestock animals, whatever, they're insects. It's all kind of the same thing, right? There's some 
You know, you got to take care of them. You got to make sure they're fed. There's like those things you got to you got to take care of, right? They, they've got to be their health's got to be in order before you really start doing anything else with them. And uh, so there was kind of some crossover, but like it's a way different game. You know, a bee, it's like its own little. You know, it's not just one bee there. It's kind of like okay, well, you've got a a little super organism, right? It's it's like a bunch of them in together. They don't move around. Cows are, you know, they're bigger. They their turnover is so much longer, right? You can have cows that are living till twenty. A beehive, you've got a hive that's like still strong after three years. Like that's pretty good, but you know she'll be gone probably. Like she's gonna replace her queen probably. Like four or five year old hive is pretty rare, but like cows, they like they take forever to develop. You know, it's different. You know, yeah, you can probably get more emotionally attached. That was probably not a good idea. You know, like any business, but like it's different. But very much the same. It's life, but it's yeah, it's way different. And like, it's like different, pro- same problems, but like scaled up. Like cows are huge, right? And it's oh, that's yeah. a whole other game, right? Like, sure, don't like insects, you know, stinging you and all that stuff. Like, think of a cow. Like cows, usually they don't, you know, you don't bother them from doing much of anything. But like, you got they got you got to respect them too. At the same time, they're ten times your your weight. Well, they require a lot more yeah. space, right? <laughs> they require much more space. They have a lot more, to, a lot more to feed, and you know they've got got other little ones they've got to take care of and it's it's quite interesting and like you know they've got problems like anybody else right during birth or life or rearing and all that stuff so it's quite interesting it's That's, quite fun that would be unique to have that kind of perspective on animals i think living in the city i mean i grew up in the city and haven't really ever had that exposure to farming or even hunting or anything mm-hmm. so just having that like that direct relationship with animals and just seeing the hardships that they go through and and the it's the humanize or humanizing for lack of a better term but just like they seem more real yeah. to you and you understand them more um on a personal note one of the coolest experiences i had and it's it's it'll be it's kind of strange when you think of it but it was at animal kingdom in uh uh, Disney World, and so they have gorillas on display, and so they're in captivity. They have, I mean, a decent size place, but they're they're very much they only know this small world. Whereas if they're in the wild, they would have, you know, they'd be reigning supreme in in like far off distances. But it was looking them in the eye and seeing something very human about them, just in terms of you could actually read their emotions similarly to human beings, hmm. which I found to just be kind of s- serene or inspiring or what, yeah like once you know ter- they have personalities these things you know yeah. <laughs> like and the fact that one of them was puffing out his chest and looking straight straight at me too i don't know if he actually was challenging but, you <laughs> yeah challenging me there was another time with an albino kangaroo but <laughs> um but he was beating his chest looking at me and then eventually one of them was kind of curious about us but then got a little bit shy and, and literally walked behind a stump and turned the other way so it didn't have to look at us. <laughs> and it was just, it was weird to read. I could have just sat there for, or stood there for hours and just watched these gorillas and how they interacted with both you and themselves and even the banana they were eating. It was just, it was a really cool thing to see, but also a little bit sad in the fact that this isn't them in their natural habitat. This is them in an enclosed space and they don't get to, Mm-hmm. get to be free yeah fulfill and, their you know like natural um path or whatever yeah it's like that too you know like you know I, I raise them up until a certain age and then we sell them right you can't get too attached but you can't help it you know some of yeah. these animals you're with you know you deal with them like say some of these cows you'll probably you could, you could, they could be around for 20 years and then but like you know all their all their calves you know you you raise them you know so you have to calve them out so you see them from birth and then you know you keep them for a good you've, yeah, a little over a year and then you know, they're almost at a mature age, and you sell them, and you're like, oh, you know, these are real nice animals, so you can't get too attached, but at the end of the day, you know, that's my, that's yeah. my living right there. Yeah. But it's, I find it really nice, like, the best parts of my day working on the farm is just when I move the cows or other things, like, that's my favorite part of the job, you get to see them in their natural habitat, eating grass, like, there's no care for the world, and, like, people suck to deal with cows, they, you know, like, they'll do <laughs> stupid stuff, like, you know, they go under the fence, they break the fence, they do shit like that. But you know what? They're way easier than people to deal with. That's for sure. <laughs> Seems like they have a peaceful existence. Just sitting out there eating some grass and just enjoying the nice days. Sound and... much easier than I grew up on an emu farm. So oh. uh, uh, emus tend to try to, as, if you're shorter than them, they'll try to dominate you. 
<laughs> <laughs> so you have to like all it takes is as long as you're taller than them. So I would just raise my hand. So my I was taller. Than this I was about six seven years old when this happened. And as soon as you're taller than them, they back right down. They will not mess with anything that's taller than them. And they but they can get pretty tall, up to six feet tall. Um, but yeah, you can get emotionally attached to them too, and they can get affectionate towards you. Yeah, and like, yeah. Like you'll have one that you feed a bottle. They'll rub their head yeah. up against you and everything. Yeah. So I know as a kid, and when it came time to slaughter them, I, my father would send me inside. Oh. But one day, yeah, no, it's like I wanted to see the process. So the, mm -hmm. it's not, it's heartbreaking oh, in yeah. a way. But you know be, what? Yeah. It's the, the price of what you're going to get, right? Like, hey, if I'm going to be eating these animals, right? I have to, at least how I see it, because, you know, we'll do a lot of on farm butchering of our own stuff and stuff like that. It's just, hey, if I want that privilege of being able to eat, you know, whatever, it's, you know, these butcher chickens, well, then you know what? It, you know, these animals got to die too, right? So it's just part of the process and you have right. to like, you can't have, you can't have it all. You can't have chickens without killing them or you can't have, you know, this beef. So it's just, you got to accept that. And then it's just, that's just life. Right. You know? They're not pets. Like it's a They're business at the end of the well, day. Well, no. Right? And it's just, yeah, that's, it's like anything else, whatever you're eating, right? It had to, it had to live and it had to die. Whether it was that corn plant, you had to kill that corn plant too, right? Yeah. But obviously I was... it's a living animal. It's different, but you have to, okay. You have to, how I see it is just, you know, you have to, to embrace that, okay, it's life and that's its purpose and you have to respect that, right? I always try day. to see it in the way that um, out in the animal kingdom, yeah. the way animals die tend to be very brutal. Yeah, it would have um, got killed by something anyways. Something right, would ate it. exactly. Whereas at least this, uh, it's kind of like a mercy killing in a yeah. way. Like it's going to be end fast for, for them. So. Well, that's their, if it wasn't for us raising them, they probably, like they'd be wild animals and they wouldn't really exist in that amount. Yeah. So like that's, that's just their purpose. At the end of the day, I'm, you know, and without me, they're pretty like, you know, through years of selective breeding and they're just kind of like, ugh, like if you weren't there, man, they can't figure it out. At least for the cows, they're just like, they couldn't figure it out. They can't open their own gates and find more grass. Like they're just like, oh, we need you. Yeah, exactly. So, that's it's kind of funny that way. That's interesting to look at in terms of their purpose and also just the having a philosophy on, on sort of their purpose, but then their life and death. And, and even it seems that people that, I mean, people that are against farming or hunting or whatever, that it's like, it's the philosophy that death is a bad thing no matter what, whereas like everything has the right to live forever. And it's like, well, that's not realistic. Like we're all yeah. gonna go someday. Like, I mean, yes, there's Russian scientists trying to cure death, but mm -hmm. in terms of like, <laughs> right? And who knows what'll happen in the next hundred years with technology and things, which is a completely different subject altogether, but it's like, We've had this natural existence for yeah. so long. And natural existence means birth, live, mature, and then decline into death, which we all like. And, and obviously, it's sort of that fear that knowing that that day is coming drives you yeah. as, a, as a human being. But it's interesting to look at it in, in terms of farming and just be like, no, they still have purpose. They still have, I mean, it's yes, it's our sustenance, but it's somehow part of this this. I want to say circle of life, very Lion King oriented, but you know, it's, it's, I mean, if you look at, at antiquity and, and, and the way that humans have evolved as hunter gatherers and just like that, that's, it's been part of the process and we're part of this food chain. Mm -hmm. I think it's now we just separate ourselves so much from that mm -hmm. natural environment and animals in general that we just, we go like, oh, we're so different. And then there's the like, yeah, that disconnect. But even to the point where, like, well, we shouldn't eat animals because we're not part of that yeah. environment. Part of it is, yeah, there's less people in the country. People are, yeah, they have less exposure to it, you know. Um, like I think I was saying earlier with the honey, it's like, well, not everybody in the world has beehives so they can have their own honey. So those people have to do it on a large scale. That goes back to myself. More people have, say, moved to the city or whatnot. You know, not everybody has a cow in the backyard that, you oh. know, when she gets old, we'll butcher it and we'll have ground beef forever. It's like, you know, me, I have to, I scale up. So I've got a shitload of them. Yeah, of them right and you guys don't so and you know i have so many well i'll just sell them all right because i have a scale thing and you know it's cheaper to run well what's the difference between having 200 cows or 100 well 10 minutes you know stuff like that yeah. so um yeah it's definitely a different perspective because the like the life and death thing you were saying like every day right because every day i gotta make sure that they're still alive right i can't i can take a day oh, that's kind of that's kind of my issue with like hardcore activists or at least some of them um, is is that they don't have the perspective of someone like a farmer or a hunter, and so they're they're 
a lot of them are like, well, you can't eat meat. Mm-hmm. You can't kill animals. It's animal cruelty. All animals should live forever. <laughs> like, it just seems yeah. like that kind of mentality. Tell that to a, a bald eagle, not, man. He's got, like, he's killing stuff every right. day. But it's, it's also not realistic. And yeah. you, we also have overpopulation problems in the States. I know hogs are a huge overpopulation problem. Here, there's deer overpopulation. So mm-hmm. hunting, in, in a way, is, is in terms, it's mercy killing so they're going to die eventually because they're going to run out of food source. Yeah, they'll either get killed by something else or there'll be so many, they'll disease or something. Yeah. It's, yeah. One long of the you're... things, the, the side of it that I get is that you almost need people to be very passionate about it in terms of fair treatment towards animals. You're, so now you're a cattle farmer, you're a beekeeper. Yeah. Um, Practicing what jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Practicing jiu-jitsu. jiu-jitsu. How did you practice. get to these three things? <laughs> okay. And where did you initially want to be? Well, I don't know. I never really thought of, like, I don't know, I guess back when I was in high school and school, I never really thought, ah, farming, whatever, we'll see. But I wasn't too enthused about it right off the bat, at least being in high school. I only got to wanting to come back to the farm, say, it was like, I don't know, in my 20s or something, after I was, after I was in high school. Um, as as far as like the jiu-jitsu and the MMA and stuff that I do, I kind of, my dad had broken his hip when I was in uh, high school and like he was, he was in a trench and the thing collapsed on him and he was broke his hip and so he was at home a lot recovering from this terrible accident, right? They had to replace the thing. So we were watching a lot of TV. We had gotten one of these pay-per-view boxes or, you know, like the, it was like hacked um, satellite dish, <laughs> like the yeah, sat, cool sat, whatever. So we'd have all the codes and we, uh, we, we Jimmy rigged that up when he was there. And <laughs> so we'd get all these pay-per-views and my dad's like, yeah, you got to watch these, these UFC things. And so we started watching, this is crazy. And then you're like, these guys are fighting and I'm like, holy shit, this mm-hmm. is awesome to watch. This is really cool. And then I remember watching one, the guy from Winnipeg, like Joe Dirks. And I'm like, this is crazy. I'm like, this is possible in my head. I was like, you know, I could do this maybe, you know, if I just found the right gym or if I just, this is possible. I could, you know be in this situation one day. I was like, this is really cool. So I'm going to so inform myself. Here's the small Winnipeg <laughs> throw in that Joe Dirksen worked out at the same gym as me when I finished high school. So yeah, he was at, shout out McDole's. But he, yeah, he, he trained McDowell's. there. He did weight training there. I'm sure he did like, yeah. you know, his his UFC, MMA style training in, another gym, at, in yeah. other gyms. But so there you go. There's the tie in the one degree of separation there. Exactly. And like, so, you know, you go through high school and finally when I moved to the city I'm like well I gotta try this I did my research and I started just training and you know like it's super fun super rewarding I don't know I never really saw myself doing it before then it was never even a thought but then like you open up a whole different world and it's like life is different after point A like you do your first day and you do some Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or whatnot and it's like wow this is just really rewarding you get to learn about you know your your limitations, you know, like what's good for you. Like I'm a small guy, so you learn real quick how to figure things out in that sport. And it's, you, know, you, you learn a lot about your body, a lot about your mindset. Sometimes it's just easier to give up, but sometimes you got to push and you got to just be better. And it's, I find that's a really rewarding um, thing I have gotten. How long have you been doing it now? Um, <clears throat> so I think I, uh, ooh, I think I started, I think 20 or 21 when I first moved to the city from the country. I was like, oh, okay, finally I moved here. I'll be able to actually like commit to something like this so I don't have to drive and stuff like that. So I think I've been doing it for five years now. So I've been doing, yeah, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And then I've been also like training MMA and stuff just with aspirations of competing in any way, shape possible. Yeah. So now you have a, a fight next week. Yeah. And so what's the training process been like for that? And and how do you feel going into it? Is it This is your first fight Yeah, this well? will be my first oh, wow. uh, mixed martial arts fight. Yeah, like I've had a few... Within the last year, I've had some uh, like Muay Thai kickboxing fights um, at a, in like Ontario and stuff. But yeah, as far as MMA, which is what I train more at, I'd say my strengths are more in. Um, this is the first time. So the preparation, well, that's kind of like what you hear about, you know, like you got to work hard for a certain amount of weeks. And then like now that it's getting closer, you got to gotta rest up. You got to get your weight on a certain point And you got to get yourself ready. Drink lots of water. So you always have to go to the bathroom, it seems like, when you have to drink four liters of water <laughs> in a day. So, but uh, like for the most part, during the summer, I don't train too much. So I've been kind of like just farm hustling. And then he's like, hey, you know, we can get you a fight. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll make it work. He's like, well, these fights don't come too often because, you know, the, the scene is kind of 
hit and miss. Like there's no amateur mixed martial arts in Manitoba because oh, it's no? not sanctioned. So we have to travel. But since we're a good gym and we're in Manitoba, nobody wants to fly out guys that are going to beat your hometown boys. <laughs> so I guess this time they're taking a gamble. So um, like it's in Alberta. But, so we got to go on Thursday and whatnot. So yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, you got to like say four or six weeks, you got to train hard, you know, get used to like the, the in live, like the, you know, the punching and your grappling and, you know, your cardio, which is the, the hardest part, your anaerobic fitness, you know, being able to keep working without oxygen because, you know, you can't breathe as fast as you're going to work and it's quite tiring, right? You know, wrestling and jujitsu and stuff like that. It's, you know, you don't get breaks sometimes. So it's, uh, the preparation is almost honestly kind of the funnest part. The dieting so-so. It's actually not too bad. It's kind of, you know, kind of rewarding. Your stomach, stomach shrinks. It's crazy. What's like, your diet like? Um, ah, you cut it back on a bit of carbs. You still got to eat them, but like, you know, you want to be just really nutritious stuff. You know, you eat a lot of protein and like I go a lot on the vegetables. So just, you know, make sure you get all your good stuff in first and a lot of water, you know, try to keep it in a routine. Um, like I've, I've played around with some of these guys do like this intermittent fasting and like you could play with different ratios and stuff and I'm not too keen on it this camp, but like as long as I'm, you know, I'm not going to stay up all night and eat, but like if I can stay within 12 hours, I can eat and then the other 12 hours, nothing. Or even sometimes I do like 10 hours. That's when I got to eat. And then the rest of the time off, it kind of helps keep things structured. Yeah. So hmm. it's discipline a little bit too, right? Are you going to have to cut a lot of weight? The water, yeah. Yeah? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, I've set myself, and it's not too hard. Once you've done it a few times, but it's still, it's definitely a stress, whether it's like you got to, whether you go in like an Epsom salt bath and then you like sweat it out or you go in the sauna and you like croak, <laughs> die for a little bit, yeah. But it's, it's not so bad. Like if you're pushing it weight-wise, like if you're doing like a large amount, then it can definitely get tough, but I'm not doing too crazy. Like I'm not doing anything over 10% of my body weight. So I think I'm in a safe spot. But then again, like pretty small guys, so how much can you lose, right? So for us, you have to be more careful. But the bigger guys can definitely swing a, a big drop of weight. I didn't know uh, MMA is not sanctioned in Manitoba. Is well, what's the reason it, it behind is? that? I don't exactly know. I think it's just not having groups of the people who are in the community getting organized and making something happen. Oh, okay. But uh, like you can you get sanctioned for professional fights so if you're getting paid so all of our pro guys have opportunities to compete in the province but as far as amateur no not really and that kind of is in my in my opinion it's a bit counterintuitive right because you want to develop these people through the amateur circuit right right because you know there's there's a bit more rule framework and you know you'll stop a fight a bit faster than um, in a professional bout so Instead of just guys saying, well, I can't compete here. I'll just turn pro right away, which is totally doable. You know, there's no, I don't think there's anything stopping you from, but, you know, you're, you're, you're fighting a bigger dog at that point. And in my opinion, that will force some people that are maybe on the fringes or don't want to or shouldn't even be fighting. It'll push them to fight pro and it just kind of muddles everything up. Like it's, I think it would be smarter um, from whether it's harm reduction or just developing talent to sanction it within the province, but it's just stupid that way. Stupid. You heard me at first here. <laughs> the breaking news. Yeah. No, so it's like that. And then, like, for a while, it was in Saskatchewan, so we, we could go there. But I think they, the, some of the rural framework changed out there. So it's just pros as well. So it's that's MMA for you. It's kind of a weird scene. So you got to just take them when you can, those fights. So, yeah. So who's your favorite UFC fighter? Currently, oh right, or or, this question or history. history, or history. Actually, uh, no, I think my favorite one, the one I'd always like be chipper on watching fights for, was uh, this guy. Um, he was probably one of the first like lighter weight class guys to kind of uh, get popular. Uh, Miguel Torres, he had this mullet. Mm. He was kind of the skinny Mexican guy, and I always loved watching this guy's fights. He was super scrappy and <laughs> just just a beast. Yeah. For a one thirty five guy, like I was, I'm just, thinking of Clay Guido when you're talking okay. about that. But the, just the the hair, and he would go even from outside the ring before the match. He would be bouncing around and jumping around for a good five minutes before the fight started, and then would just go crazy and swinging. And then he was in a lot of brawls. Yeah, but he was fun to watch. My favorites though were uh, Rampage Jackson, but I think even in the old Pride days. When he knocked out the guy by slamming him, by yeah, slamming yeah. him into the into the mat, and uh, but now lately it's been Rose Namajunas. So the, she's pretty scrappy. She's just 
It's it's actually the person that she yeah. is, but then she fights that way. She's just the the humble warrior type, yeah. which is something that I very much I don't, I relate to that and and her message behind her fighting, the yeah. fact that she was like she won a championship belt and just was like, "Let's love each other." And yeah. it's like that seems so profound to be like, I just fought somebody and knocked them the fuck out. And then yeah, here I let's am. Be friends. And like, let's all get along and be friends and like defeat the bully. But, you know, at the end of the day, I still care about that person. Yes. You know, I still care about everybody. And Canadians are just cool with each other. I don't know how most other people are, but just a good culture we have. It seems like nobody has really too much of a problem with anybody else. And I always thought that was real good. About, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's always the minor exceptions. But yeah. 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 I, for the most part, I think that's true. You compare us to somewhere like the states, where a much more yeah. chill and atmosphere we, in general. We still have our demons. Oh, we yeah. really do. If you look at colonialization and Aboriginal populations, and exactly how oh, yeah. that relationships went, and and there's there's steps I think in the right direction, yeah. um, but there's always things that we can do better, and probably new ideas that Absolutely. can 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 make the process a little bit. I don't know. Can just make that positive difference and that positive change in the community. But there's just, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things for us to work through and for us to, I don't know. It's like if you sweep problems under the rug for too long and don't talk about them, they're just going to resurface. They they just, they resurface and they, you know, nothing ever really changes in that sense. So yeah, that's, I guess a little bit of a different note, but I think there's everybody overcomes those hardships too. Right, like everybody has those parts in their story, those difficult things that you've had to overcome. I don't think anybody gets through this life without suffering loss or going through struggles of your own. Yeah, and I think it's being accepting of that, it, even in yourself, and being like, it's okay that I went through that that frustrating time or like yeah. that issue or that problem or that breakup or whatever it Once is. Once you realize everybody's going through a pile of crap, anyways, that you're like, oh wait. This is adversity everywhere, right? So I'm yeah. not the only victim of this crap, and so I'm just gonna put your head up and keep on trucking. Like it's just, yeah, you can't sit there and feel sorry for yourself. Speaking of which, what would you say is your biggest obstacle you've have had to overcome for whatever know. reason? I don't know. <sighs> That's a tough one. There's a pile of stuff you could, but. Nothing you could say that's, you know, you can't get overcome by anything. Um, I don't know. I've always, uh, you know, I've always thought, um, I suppose, my parents were divorced. I always thought that was a bit of a, not really a struggle because they got along and they made sure everything was real cool. And, you know, I've never felt unloved by my parents or anything. But I always thought that was kind of like a, an interesting uh, situation in my life or an interesting circumstance that I've had to deal with. And, like, I don't have any answers. And I'm like, whatever. It's just the way it is. And. You know, I've never been anybody else but myself, so I don't have any outside perspective. I don't have any uh, view of any other way of how it should be. So I'm just, you know, like I'm beyond the fact. Like I'm just, this is me. So I guess maybe that's one struggle. You know, you you can't help but ask yourself, especially if you're a kid or even an adult, right? Um, questions just uh, always loom. But yeah. other than that, I don't know. You've yourself. You know, you're. That, that's one challenge that everybody faces, um, just trying to, um, you know, better yourself. Um, I remember when I, kid, I uh, when I was a kid, you know, in school, I didn't really care too much. And then finally, like, my mom kind of instilled for me, you know, like, hey, we got you know, to work on school stuff, get better. And from then on, I think every year in, in sc- whether it's elementary school, high school, or university, it's like, as I've gotten older, I've cared more. So it's like from being in grade six to... You know, my mom hounding on me like let's do all the spelling and the math stuff like we got to get your you know, we, we got to do your homework I'm going to help you do your homework and all that stuff and I didn't really care and then like a year okay I cared a bit more and then it okay I, I would see that okay if I, if I do this work now there's going to be a point like there's a reason I'm learning this stuff and then it became sort of less of an issue and then I was more self-motivated and boom 12 in school I'm doing pre-calc and doing all that stuff and I'm like this is pretty good I'm self-motivated and then in university well I, I want to do it and then like you know, well, it's my money on the line, just things like that. I'm properly motivated when I'm in university. I'm not just there and like, man, whatever. Year one courses, blah, 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 just got to pass. Like then I'm a straight A student now. It's, it's a lot of it is just finding the ability to motivate yourself. That's maybe been been a challenge. And I've, I'm happy I've been able to overcome that. Like there's nothing worse than 
I think people that are not motivated all day or are not motivated but can't find that that way to to just uh, make that fire inside kind of thing. I think that's maybe one way. I don't know. I don't know For if that sure. was yeah. a challenge, but that's one thing in uh, yeah. my life. I, I don't know. It's good to be self-motivated and teach yourself that because it's, Man, everything sucks. Like every day, like you know, you get days that are like, oh, you know, you're waiting for this, waiting for that, but like you can't just. That's just an everyday life. Like, yeah, I've also seen it. You know, days are pretty average. Every day is pretty average. Like, you know, life's not a highlight reel. People think, oh, yeah, I'm gonna start doing these things, and it's gonna be like this, and it's like, well, no, it's not gonna be like that montage in that movie. You know, like it's gonna be well, pretty. You're gonna have these crappy, boring days where you're waiting and doing that, and I've accepted that. So I've been. I'm pragmatic in the approach of every day, but you can get quite a bit done if you just keep on chipping those small days in. I think we've talked about it on here before, but we do live in an age now where we are bombarded by highlight reels in terms of, you said movies is one of them. Instagram. Instagram yeah. is the big one. As you much as I the, love it, it You it, see the easily. best part of everyone's life, but you don't see the bad parts of it either. Yeah. It's always the best parts, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, you know, like I post a lot, like I love Instagram and I post a lot of stuff, whether it's farming um, you know, just on my personal one or like, you know, on the on the beekeeping side, like, you know, you're not going to post your your really bad days. And I don't know if I'd want to. Right. Right. But, you know, I suppose it is important. Maybe, you know, it's something I should work towards, you know, have a more, more realistic out, uh, outlook and the way I perceive a message or whatnot. Right. Because it takes everybody's part. Right. But it's yeah, it's not to get sucked on that, you know, being on your feet all day and seeing all these awesome things and then you know, expecting out of yourself, you know, you maybe, maybe you've put a good day in and you get home and you start going on Instagram and then you're like, oh man, I'm not doing so good or I should be elsewhere. It's like, well, you just forget here a couple hours ago, you've been putting it in, even in, you know, if it ends bad, you know, you'll get good days and bad days. So it's yeah. just putting that in perspective and yeah, social media can kind of mess you up with that, but good tool. Yeah. It's really that acceptance. Yeah. It's so even in this past week, it's been something I was talking about to this to this point, to Jace earlier, and it was the acceptance of where you are in the moment. And and so whether you've had those bad days, whether you're having that bad day, yeah. it's, it's you, you can say that it's okay in your own mind. Like it's, there are these things, maybe, you know, it is a windy day, the bees aren't there and you want it, and you have a big order or yeah. something. And, and, and so that gets frustrating, but it's like, yeah, it's okay to feel that frustration in those points. And then when you're having great days, it's like, it's okay to appreciate you're having those great days too. And just be like, you know, even the why behind that and accepting that, okay, well, it's been a great day. You know, work didn't even feel like work. It just yeah. flowed by and had great conversations, whether it's in the office or, you know, with people in the community or yeah. that neighbor that comes by. It's, um, it's just accepting where you are in that moment. But then the other side of that was actually, it's, it's sort of a personal um I want to say paradigm shift, but that inner speak that, I mean, we spend time with uh, almost 10,000 thoughts every day is, is an average day for human beings. And 10,000? 10, 10,000 thoughts. Oof. I mean, That's I guess, it, I don't know how Some different Some of them are real short, are. you know? Yeah. <laughs> but just be like, well, like, you think of hunger, I got to go to the washroom, like, all those Everything, little yeah. intricacies, yeah. what am I, well, and you think, if if you're doing work or even you gotta oh, I gotta look here then look here do then this. look oh, here yeah, you don't really yeah, yeah, yeah. you rarely even realize or even the stigma or the not the stimuli so listening to something or hearing something My going hands on cold. yeah yeah so you're constantly bombarded with those but then if you have negative self speak and and again we always talk about momentum and it's sort of you can have that inner outlook that you know, things are bad. And then, so the book said to say stop when you, you hear those negative self-talk. It said to audibly do it, but I was at work, so I didn't feel like that was necessary. <laughs> but so I, I said it in my head, and I probably caught myself three times in the next five minutes or so and really went stop. It's, you know, it's okay that you're feeling this, but is there a way we can frame this that's either neutral or positive or, or what have you? And literally by that afternoon, I felt great yeah. about everyone, my place in both the office, the world, and sort of just what I was doing. And just, it changed into a positive day. And that's escalated for the past three days have been probably the best that I can remember in the past six months or so. I mean, you go through those great times and you almost don't even know why. Yeah. But it's crazy when you have that conscious thought that, oh, I'm... I changed my mindset and now I'm having a great day. I didn't know I had that type of power to actually 
change my uh, brain synapses or mm -hmm. whatever, whatever controls that, but controls mood, right? Yeah. And so your brains are bondable that way. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's weird to think you can train your inner self as much as your outer self to do things and oh, to feel absolutely. things. And, and yet, you know, it's, it's that knowledge that, so I think of the yin and yang symbol, the fact that, you know, there's the little bit of positive in the darkness. So that's hope. The yeah. fact that like, even in those bad times, things can get better. And then there's even the little bit of darkness in the light. It, even if things are perfect that day, you know, this too shall pass. And yes, typically the days are pretty average if you yeah. put them on a scale, right? But it's it's just learning to live with that and, and yeah. to, you know, negative or, or, you know, feeling emotion isn't a bad thing. And having a bad day makes you appreciate those good days. So part it's, of it. yeah. Yeah. it's just part of living and moving and progressing forward and just accept the fact you got to have some bad days too it can't all be good so it's like okay exactly. whatever they're just there so and i've also been reading a bit about like like stoicism and stuff you know which is about like accepting whatever is like okay something bad happens you know can you do anything about it now um yes okay well then go do whatever you need to do if not well then okay no sense getting too mad about stuff which you, know, you can't help yourself sometimes but it's just a good way of being like okay um, next if you had advice that you would give somebody trying to make a positive difference on their lives what would it be mm, i'll keep it simple just do good things i remember telling myself that when i was in like late high school or something i was trying to get like i don't know my philosophy going on on stuff i don't know it was pretty basic i was like well if i just do good things it's probably a good bet it's pretty loose and i'm like well that kind of goes beyond any religious philosophical whatever thing it's like you can dilute that pretty easily to anybody who's going to be on that realm pretty yeah. fast like everybody's yeah. gonna get you so do good things i don't know um no i don't know everybody's pretty cool at the end of the day like nobody's uh like everybody's pretty understanding everybody's pretty pragmatic once you gotta get to start talking with them right nobody's too unreasonable so like i think everybody can just get along and doing the right thing for the most part is uh yeah that's is the, all you can really give like you try your best and uh, it's hard. I'm in advice. I'm only 26, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that's that, I think that's, in a sense, it is a spiritual thing to think. Orient yourself towards the good. Whatever, yeah. whatever that means. I mean, you can break that down into philosophy and things, yeah. too. Like, what is inherently good? Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, but if you're orient... We each got a good, we got a good enough idea of what it is. You know, like, you can't think too much. Like, hey, I know what's good generally. Can't kid me that, you know. You can't kid a 12-year-old. You can't kid an 8-year-old. Like, hey, do do some good stuff. And you're like, okay, they'll be generally speaking. Yeah. Like, everybody's on board with that. So yeah. it's pretty simple. Yeah, that's fair. And even limiting that negativity, too, yeah. in that sense. Like, take out the negative things that, that take away from you doing good in yeah. your own life. Yeah. I'm trying yeah, to think of awesome. any other questions or things that we, topics we should cover. I didn't look at my notes, baby. Maybe more than one. I think we... Covered most of most it. Most of it, yeah, I think so. Um, well, so to conclude, how can we stay up to date with Luc Bernard and Happy Honey? Well, you can. I you can follow Happy, uh, what underscore wait, yeah, underscore Honey underscore MB on Instagram. So uh, Happy Honey MB uh, on Instagram. You can just search Happy Honey on Facebook. I've got a page. I kind of limp go those together so whenever they've got pictures up you can kind of follow me there message me there if you want some honey we can probably meet up i can deliver something like that we'll make it work um upcoming events well i guess i'm fighting in lethbridge alberta at rumble in the cage 59 i think Ooh. um so that's in a week if you guys want to show up in wonderful <laughs> lethbridge please do if not whatever um you can also follow me on instagram on my personal one farmer luke um, L O U C, wait, farmer underscore L O U C, <laughs> and you'll see lots of cows and weather and other things. Um, I don't know. Uh, follow these guys. Um, <laughs> follow these guys. I yeah, I don't know if you if you want to follow me on those social media is, pages. Uh, come join the adventure. Is your UFC name also Farmer Luke? <laughs> no, no. Are really you coming out as that Farmer would Luke? Pretty and, incredible. I'm I've just thought saying. it because everybody calls me that, but I'm always but I've been like because they were like nickname on the on the order form and i was like i was like i could i might uh, i was like nah i won't i won't bother i don't want any i don't uh, want to i don't want to blush i'm saying going forward you gotta you gotta own it you yeah. gotta own the farmer luke and you gotta come out and like 
I don't know what your farmer style is, but yeah. like I'm thinking full cowboy hat and just like maybe not overalls with or, the honey. <laughs> Bring with us the honey. honey. <laughs> with, with a piece of weed in your mouth or something. Yeah. Whatever it with is, the, play with it out. With a bee suit on and a lot yeah. of <laughs> If you came out in a bee suit, that would be... With the veil yeah. on and everything. <laughs> if, if you, like, UFC fight on, on TV and, and you come out on the bee suit, I think you actually win the day, regardless oh, of the outcome of the I would pay fight. to see that. It beats any of these, like, the, the in boxing once you guys get with the sombrero. Like, it beats any of that <laughs> stuff. Get out of here. So... Yeah. Yeah. No. That's that's uh, that's what I'm up to. How where you can catch me, follow me, whatever. Um. Perfect. Awesome. And as always, we're be the change. You can check our website out at be the change yps dot com. You can email us. No longer at the former dots in the email. It's now info at be the change dot com. So only one dot in right. there. Info but at be the change yps dot com. Be the change. Oh, I might just, you know what? We'll update that. We'll put that in something because I just have be the change on here. So we'll double check. Um, I can't think of any announcements. It's probably a new way to listen to the episode that you're listening to now. Hope you enjoy it. As always, if you have any tips and or info or anything you want to submit to the show, uh, send it to the email or reach out to us on our Instagram or Facebook pages, which are both be the change YPS. Um, Otherwise... Closing thoughts, anybody? I just want to thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thanks for bringing some amazing honey. It tastes amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's... I love the buckwheat honey. I got to try some more of that. I'll bring it home. Of, it's yours. I'm happy you guys awesome. tried it out. Yeah. So thank you Thanks very for having much. me.